you very much for uh, for coming to this round table. Um, on behalf of OSA, I would like to sincerely thank everyone um, for, for, um, for being part of this conversation. Um, this is uh, a conversation, this event is part of the conversation, uh, uh, various conversations that are happening as part of, of OSA's uh, knowledge network. Uh, OSA has an expert African uh, experts knowledge network in various uh, uh, clusters that are important for Africa's peace development and um, uh, security issues. This uh, particular cluster is on cluster six, which is on energy and uh, climate change. Today uh, on this uh, event, we have uh, seven experts. Uh, we have recording Ms. in progress. Sorry, um, we have Mr. Cody Adujulu, who is the executive head of energy and infrastructure finance for West Africa at Standard Bank. We have Dr. Albert Buteri, um, chief executive officer of African um, Energy Service Group Limited, and who is also the former minister of um, state for energy water and communications for the Republic of Rwanda. We have Mr. Alkali Conde, an economist and an expert in strategy and sustainable development. We have Dr. Aruna Dayadu, research director uh, for um, the Fr uh, France National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, IRD. We have Dr. Charlemagne Kwekam, founder and chief executive of uh, Brain Consulting and Co-Agency in Douala, Cameroon. We have Dr. Musa Na Abu Mamuda, who is the coordinator of Enda Energy, uh, Energy in Niger. And uh, last but definitely not least, um, Ms. Anita Otubu, who is the head of project management unit for the Nigeria Electric Electrification Project, um, under the Rural Electrification Agency. So on behalf of OSA, I sincerely, sincerely would like to thank you. Um, we're just going to start, uh, as Ndidi uh, said before, this is going to be a free, a free flow conversation, meaning that, I mean, we're, we're going to be discussing two main areas. The first part we, we want to get into is recognizing Africa's unique needs and circumstances. And uh, as negotiations are happening at COP right now, we are calling for a differentiated and just transition. The second part that we want to discuss is when we look at the practical realities, um, finance is a key issue. And we are going to discuss about what, what is needed to access sufficient, predictable, and sustained financing. So with that, um, I'll just uh, ask Dr. Daidu, who, um, who is, you know, who, who, who has worked extensively on issues of um, climate, water, and energy food nexus in Africa. And he's also the lead author of the IPCC special report on the incidences of the 1.5 uh, global warming. And he was also the review editor for the last uh, very sobering IPCC uh, assessment report. So in terms of climate uh, issues, uh, the broad picture uh, and its implication of um, implications for, for Africa. Aruna, if you could please uh, give us the lay of the land. Thank you. Alors, très bien. Tout d'abord, merci de m'avoir invité à... First and foremost, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this panel. I didn't think that I would be the first to speak today, but I would first like to focus my presentation on the most important messages in the IPCC report. I think that the most important thing to keep in mind is the 1.5 degrees global warming for 2050, 2060 
according to the 2015 Paris Agreement. And it seems that the original goal of 2050, 2060 might uh, actually, this might actually be exceeded in 2030. In both the old reports, we had some intervals with respect to uh, human induced climate change. And today, in today's reports, we have seen that most of this change is due to human activity. And the next thing that I would like to convey is that if we want to respect the Paris Agreement, we need to conduct a transition that has to start now. We have to make efforts in order to change our methods of production. We need to have a message of hope in all of this, which is that we need to conduct this transition. And another important message is as follows. The high frequency of extreme climate events, which are becoming more intense, more frequent, which negatively affect the development of African states and human safety is a very important uh, factor in climate change. It's a very important thing to consider, and we need to emphasize this. Moreover, the fight against climate change had been mostly focused on CO2 to this day, but in this latest report, we have learned that methane and NO2 levels had never been as high as they have become recently. Even though methane stays only at about 10 years in the atmosphere, its heating power is four times as strong as for CO2. And Africa faces a major issue because this is a gas that is produced by agriculture, farming, livestock farming, deforestation. So we have a window for Africa to take part in the fight against climate change by implementing various policies, of, for example, mitigation and adaptation. And it's important to do both of these. I will speak more about this later, but we need to implement policy that will be beneficial for both mitigation and adaptation. The last message, which is important to retain from the IPCC uh, report is rising sea levels, which will impact more than 80 million people in the very near future and which will impact the economies of many countries. For example, we can look at the entire West African coast. The uh, capitals of these countries are located mostly along the coast. Then we look at Southern Africa, we look at Northern Africa, Alexandria, all of these cities and areas are representing entire economic sectors which will be impacted by rising sea levels and also will be exacerbated by coastal erosion. So we must act. We have to do something and we have to act collectively. Africa is responsible for only three to 4% of emissions. So we need to talk about this transition, but I will stop here. Overall, I just wanted to present you some facts about the main messages of the IPCC report. Thank you very much, Aruna. Um, it is indeed a very sobering, um, uh, especially the last report was very sobering um, in terms of what what Africa um, is, is, I mean, the world as a whole, but especially Africa is facing. And what we have on 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 our plate is not just um, just the issue of contending uh, with climate change, with dealing with adaptation, but we're also looking at a huge population that is expected to double. We, we're, you know, Africa's population right now is, is estimated at 1.3 billion and it's expected to double by 2050. Uh, and the profound demographic changes are set to drive the need for economic growth, infrastructure development, and in turn, increase the energy demand for job creation, mobility, and cooling. Um, so within this, this, this uh, kind of dichotomy, I wanted to um, 
uh, call on Albert because you um, are currently working with several African countries to kind of help them um, work work on their um, their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions and what they're going to do um, as part of their um, global commitment uh, towards uh, climate, climate change, climate change issues, and as well as work on their adaptation plans, uh, given what Aruna said, especially for countries in the coastal areas, every part of the continent is going to be affected. So within the context of adaptation, uh, what, what are, what are uh, the issues that Africa is contending with um, in developing their NDCs and, and, and kind of um, looking at the climate issues that African countries have to deal with? Uh, Albert, I think you, you're muted. And I want to also oh, yeah. take this opportunity in case any any of our panelists wants to jump in with questions, comments. Uh, I'm just trying to get the conversation going, but please feel free to jump in. So thank you very much, uh, Bitsa, and uh, building on uh, also the broader uh, issues that uh, Dr. Uh, what I just uh, uh, narrated here, um, I think uh, uh, clear and countries understand right now that they need to uh, have clear NDC roadmaps that uh, reflects the mainstreaming climate change action, actions in all sectors of the economy in general, and uh, energy, uh, water, food, uh, security nexus uh, in particular. And uh, that should uh, literally capture it all. And uh, if the major focus uh, would also dwell on the SDGs, especially one, two, three, six, seven, and 13, I think uh, that may provide responses to uh, re realizing uh, the indices uh, targets. Obviously, um, uh, development is uh, is uh, is not a an a easy. It's a hard mountain climb, and therefore there are many uh, aspects and parameters that uh, build into uh, achieving that. So, uh, some of the aspects uh, I may be able to dwell on, uh, in fact. Uh, touch the thematic areas you, you have uh, provided to guide us. Uh, uh, unique uh, features of uh, Africa and uh, our needs, uh, issues of uh, climate finance, and indeed uh, on the transition uh, move of the pathways in order to achieve that. So I wonder whether at this juncture I would be able to uh, speak a bit about that or that comes a bit later? You know, really, um, you know, feel free to put uh, to put in the points that uh, that can get us moving and started and then, you know, other colleagues can jump in. Uh, for example, Charlemagne um, uh, uh, works on uh, helping countries develop energy policies and, and, and their strategies and their reg regulation. Um, Anita uh, can come in and, and the issues that you know, she's facing as she's trying to um, use, um, you know, integrate and develop and deploy uh, some of the renewable uh, options. Uh, Cody, uh, who has uh, extensive uh, you know, investment uh, experience can jump in on the private sector side. So, put in the ideas that you would like us to 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 pursue. What are what are the drivers? And then um, uh, uh, colleagues can come, can jump in. Brilliant. So let me light the landscape for indeed, and uh, it does matter when we, we can expand or touch on the aspects I'm trying to uh, provide here. In, in summary, uh, for example, uh, what are we looking at as the Africa unique needs? Unfortunately, we have competing priorities 
and these uh, will include what has just been said, uh, adaptation, uh, mitigation initiatives, uh, climate finance, uh, the market mechanisms. Uh, these ambitious NDCs that will uh, ensure uh, that we uh, arrive, we maintain 1.5 degrees. A transparency mechanism in pre-2020 mitigation commitments from developed countries. And uh, um, also um, aspects of uh, losses uh, and uh, damages that uh, unfortunately they are done, which for us to be back on track, that those may require compensations. Now, uh, when, talk, when talk of achieving that through the transition, energy transition strategies, for example, uh, emo, uh, emissions reductions planning, uh, we should focus on uh, scaling up or boosting the clean energy uh, renewable energies in their different forms. And uh, we should look at the technological digitization responses. Uh, use of hydrogen is on the increase, especially in the developing countries. It will spill over and we shall soon uh, adapt. Uh, the carbon capture mechanisms, uh, long duration storage, uh, autonomy, uh, long batteries autonomy, for example, for solar sources. Uh, those are the kind of initiatives we need to look at and the approach uh, should uh, understand and they plan uh, the achievable targets and, and put timelines and the options. And this is the responsibility uh, we, we have. And uh, actually this also tries to focus on the just uh, COP26 um, undertakings, if we have to achieve uh, the commitments we are making, try to reduce energy water use uh, through efficient uh, operations and mechanisms, uh, minimize uh, uh, hydrocarbon use, uh, flaring and other sources of uh, hydrocarbon losses and uh, greenhouse gases emissions. And uh, obviously, uh, to achieve that, we cannot uh, depend on uh, government in initiatives only. We need also to improve on uh, uh, investor propositions with the mitigation, mitigated climate-related uh, risks, and also plan on how to move on amid this uh, COVID-19 existence and its risks. So, um, so how we are able to navigate and be able to I'm getting muted automatically. I don't know, so I keep observing. So Sorry, I, I don't know. Sorry, it was me who was trying to unmute myself. Uh, I apologize. Ah, ah, okay. So, and I was saying that uh, important also, it's like uh, looking at undertaking holistic and uh, interconnected approach rather than series of separate measures. Uh, and this is where, for example, the initiative of the African continent free trade area uh, comes into consideration and the relation in particular to our focus, for example, the initiative on Africa single electricity market, in which uh, case then uh, countries are able to share and be able to uh, 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 kind of leverage on our each country. Why I'm here, I'm in Lesotho and I'm advising government on the energy reforms. So on the energy sector reform, um, you, uh, uh, you find that currently Lesotho, small as is with a, a population of only 2 million, is uh, planning installation of 90 megawatt solar. Normally, the solar not being a, a base load that normally should require a very stable network. And uh, as, separate, as a separate country, that would be difficult and destabilize the network in general. However, because it has an interconnector to uh, a powerful South African uh, 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 power network, it's easy to pump into the grid and that, that works. So that kind of uh, partnerships and arrangement is very, very important. 
and uh, also take into consideration while we are planning all that, uh, the ensuring the really uh, predictable power availability, acceptability, but also the uh, affordability where uh, off-grid solutions come on board and uh, in order to cater for uh, the populations that are far from the grid, but also the question of affordability. Capacity is a, a very serious issue that we need to look at on mitigation actions that will allow us to uh, realize the NDC's roadmaps that the countries put in place. I feel like uh, I'm talking a bit too much. I wanted to touch <laughs> also on the issue of financing, but I don't know if I can mention now, or I would uh, wait and uh, talk I think, later. Yeah, we can we can come in. Uh, we can come into the financing part uh, a bit later. Um, I have three hands. I first saw Cody, then Anita, then I see Musa. Uh, Cody, uh, please. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Pizza. Um, so just my, my first question really just around the NDCs is just to understand um, what, what is the methodology um, that actually goes behind calculating or, you know, coming up with a, you know, appropriate figure. Um, and then the second question is, you know, are there, are there variances between different, you know, different African countries in terms of the, the size of the NDCs? And if there are, um, just, just you know, if you can just give us a bit of background in terms of why why that would be, and the final one is you know in terms of public awareness. You know, even me myself as a you know, uh, I've done quite a bit in the power sector in various different countries um, on the continent. I I don't have the awareness. I I don't see. So I I couldn't tell you, for example, if someone says okay in Nigeria, what's Nigeria's NDC? I'll just look at you with a blank face. I actually don't know. So I just wanted to understand why, from a from a public awareness perspective, those numbers are not are not for Thank you. Thank you. These are excellent questions, and I think um, and I think Musa and Albert would would be great in that. Uh, Anita, uh, I'm going to give you the floor, um, and then with Musa, and then we'll go uh, we'll go back to Albert, please. Uh, thanks, Bitsat. Um, not questions, but rather comments. Um, putting it simply in layman's terms when we're talking about the unique circumstances of Africa. Um, this expectation to, uh, with regards to energy transition, knowing that uh, in Africa we're dealing with the issue of access before we could even think about uh, energy transition, tra transitioning into utilizing clean technology. Um, when you have uh, a significant portion of, of Africans who are hungry, who don't have a uh, good education, good health care and the likes, who, who are jobless, right, don't have op good business opportunities, and you talk about this topic of uh, climate change, energy transition, it, it's not really priority for them, you know, because um, they're faced with all of these other sort of um, priorities. Uh, so it's really important that we think about um, sensitizing uh, uh, Africans, sort of similar to what Toby's saying. I, I was actually even thinking from, you know, the, the grassroots, the lower levels, but it seems like a, a, a cross board. Uh, there's lots of um, training and uh, sensitization to be done in this aspect if we really truly want to achieve this um, energy transition. Um, I think that's really important. Um, also, talking about the unique um, circumstances of Africa. Speaking specifically with regards to Nigeria, we have abundance of gas, for example. Um, as I'd mentioned, talking about energy transition when we haven't achieved universal access in the country, the priority would be to achieve that universal access so as to, you know, um, get the nation to that point of, of uh, becoming industri industrialized, achieving that economic, uh, socioeconomic development um, within the country. When we, when we take into consideration uh, those aspects, I think it's important that when we are um, giving timeframes towards achieving uh, such energy transition goals, um, it's important to, to take into consideration um, yeah, some of these aspects. I just thought it was important to mention that. And then also when we talk about energy transition um, projects in, in uh, in Africa, uh, it, 
government alone and even uh, development banks, um, development partners can't achieve this um, themselves. It's really important to bring in that much needed um, private sector investment, technical expertise, but is there enough uh, incentivization? Are, are we incentivizing them enough um, to, towards um, encouraging them to, to, to help um, not only bridge the energy access gap, but also help in, um, I guess, transitioning existing technology into cleaner technology and bridging the gap with using, um, uh, you know, uh, green, greener technology. Where is the finance? What are we, what are these governments, what are African governments doing uh, to provide that enabling environment? Do they have the support that they need in order to achieve uh, this major target of, um, you know, energy transition uh, by 26, 2060, I believe that they've mentioned at COP26, I happen to be at COP26 um, currently. Uh, so these are sort of the, the concerns that, that uh, I have. And um, I've also heard from um, a number of representatives from African countries during uh, the COP discussions. This is, this is really excellent. Uh, both uh, Cody and Anita, um, you bring two very key points. First is, you know, we, we talk about NDCs. These are the front facing commitments that Africa is making, but what exactly is behind them? And are, you know, are we making sure that our priorities are really reflected in them? As Anita said, we have too many burning issues uh, on the stove. And um, you know, are we are we really being realistic in in addressing them? And there, then there's the issue of the financing part. Um, you know, we are making commitments, uh, as you said, for 2060. Is this realistic uh, from you know project development uh, point of view? From um, the right energy mixes with the phasing out commitments that we are making, does it all make sense? Uh, all excellent questions. Um, Musa, please, um, please jump in. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Kapwe. Actually, I wanted to put some thought on the energy transition as well as the unique circumstances of uh, Africa continent. But uh, maybe with a specific uh, focus on West Africa, just to say that uh, uh, 10 years uh, back, uh, or even more than 10 years back when the national adaptation plans of actions or the NAPAs have been developed by LDC countries in order to address the urgent and immediate uh, adaptation needs. We tried to look at what are the priority sectors. And uh, it emerged that most of the sectors are around uh, adaptation, water, uh, fisheries, livestock, and so on. And recently also with the development of the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, most of the West African countries have already updated their NDCs with more ambitions in order to contribute for the achievement of the 1.5 degree target. And uh, many other countries are in the process of reviewing their NDCs. And we try to do the same exercise to look at uh, what are the priority sectors that have been highlighted in these NDC documents. It appears that uh, uh, priority sectors are around, again, agriculture, water, forestry, livestock, and the fisheries. So if you look at these priority sectors, one can ask the question, what about the energy sector? Is that the energy sector is not a priority sector for West African countries or what's happening? Actually, when we have made an analysis or of the different adaptation options that have been uh, defined under each of these sectors, we realize that most of these adaptation strategies cannot take place without access to energy. So energy is a key element. It's a key missing element uh, that if we, cannot, if we are not able to ensure access to energy, definitely any adaptation action in the agriculture sector, in the water sector, 
or in the livestock sector cannot be as sustainable as we need. For instance, because of climate change, people can no longer rely on rainfall. So they have to do irrigation. And in order to do irrigation, definitely they need access to energy in order to pump water, for instance. Like the same with the water sector, uh, if they, would, they are not going to rely on rainfall, then they have to go and look for uh, surface water or uh, underground water. And this, again, needs energy. So we think that it's very important to clarify uh, that, uh, that, uh, that missing element and say that although that these sectors, uh, no, there is no energy, actually in the implementation of the actions, energy is a key element. And in, in, in relation to the, to the unique circumstances of uh, Africa, I think uh, somebody uh, may, uh, raised the idea of interconnection. And again, several years ago, when I was uh, doing my master's of science in Senegal, we tried to look at all continents globally, and we have discovered a key, a unique selling point for the Africa continent. And this unique selling point for the Africa continent is because of the fact that it is a continent that is exactly divided by the equator. And it is the only one continent that has these key characteristics. And in terms of consequences, there are lots of insights and, and great consequences because of that, uh, of that fact. If we take the agriculture sector, then it means that whatever we are being uh, producing in terms of crop in the Northern hemisphere, we will have it six months later in the Southern Hemisphere so that this crop is available in the Africa continent the whole year. And from that, we also try to see what are the opportunities for interconnections in terms of, uh, of, uh, of beyond the borders adaptation strategies. Because nowadays we remark that many countries are doing adaptation at country level. But climate change is a global issue. So definitely we need to look for interconnections in order to design a, a beyond borders climate change adaptation strategies. And in order to do that, we need to look at similarities between different parts of Africa. And like I have said, the fact that the equator has exactly divided the Africa continent, it means that we have very similar climates in the northern part of the Africa continent and very similar climates also in the southern part of the Africa continent. And this is a great opportunity for Africa to push forward its climate change adaptation beyond the borders and specifically on the agriculture sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Musa. Um, you, you highlighted um, a very interesting point in that even when we talk about adaptation, um, unless we have, you know, sustained energy and reliable energy, we cannot even meet our adaptation goals. Um, as we, as we, um, as we do more commitment in the in the national adaptation uh, strategies, I want to um, see if if Charlemagne wants to jump in. Um, you, I mean, he, you have experience. Um, in, in, in developing country energy uh, infrastructure projects, as well as working with countries in developing energy policies, uh, regulations, and strategies. So I, if you can touch on, uh, you know, uh, maybe another, uh, another colleague can come in on, on the development of the NDCs, what goes into them and, you know, how realistic are we being? Uh, and also for the adaptation plans, uh, as Anita said, we have many other priorities and energy is a key interlinkage. Uh, how are we featuring that in, in everything and how realistic are we being? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bitsat. Uh, I think I'm going to try to build on what have been already said by the other speakers, try to introduce my contribution. I think I have retained two main messages. The first being that the priority for the majority of African countries 
uh, basically sub-Saharan Africa, is about electricity and energy access by poor people. I think that is a constraint that will definitely uh, impact the strategies that are workable, not the strategy that are devised, but that are workable. The second issue is that uh, the NDCs, most of the time, as uh, the previous speaker said, they are developed at the country level uh, because the level of action for now is at the country level, even if the, the, the problem that they are trying to solve is a global one. So for the time being, it is very difficult to escalate the development of NDCs, even at the regional level. I think in Africa, you have some uh, regional uh, organizations that are more developed than the other. For example, if you take Central Africa uh, uh, countries, the free, uh, let's say the free uh, trade is not reality. Maybe uh, goods can circulate, but people cannot circulate. For me to go to Equatorial Guinea, I need a, a visa and we are part of an economic uh, region. So it is only in the West Africa that you can freely move. So the situations are not the same across the region in Africa. So thinking about going beyond countries as a perimeter of action for NDC will need additional work from the part of the population and the head of state. Having said that, I think what we need to understand also is that if energy access is a priority, it means that we should have a high proportion of our population that does not have access to energy. And then it means that those infrastructures, energy infrastructure are not just in place. So the term of transitioning may not be the right term because we may start from crash and going directly to the renewable energy infrastructure because we are lacking infrastructure. However, the issue is that the situation of Africa is unique. There are several factors that determine that uniqueness. The first factor is that Africa, depending on the sources, represents less than 5% of emission globally. But in terms of vulnerabilities and in terms of impact, we have large population living in slums and wet area and also living for agriculture. And those populations will be the most impacted in terms of climate change. So we are paying double penalties as a continent. We are the less polluter in the world and we are paying the high price compared to the other continent. So for this reason, I think we should develop a narrative in front of multilateral development agency and in front of advanced economies to look at the finance of energy project in Africa differently from the past. Because we are victim of the development of the other countries and we are asked to contribute to solve the problem. So we think that the narrative should include this argument of double penalties to fight for the implementation of a special fund to finance a renewable energy project in Africa. I think the other constraint that as African continent we should try to put in our narrative is the absorption capacity of African countries. Because even if those funds are made available, we will face some difficulty in consuming all those funds. Because in several of the countries, we don't have a system in place to absorb the financing and to develop and complete high quality energy infrastructure project. The first factor that we can include in what I call uh, absorption capacity issue is the re regulation in place and the private 
public-private partnership system. Because I think every, everyone is aware that uh, public investment will not fill the gap. So we need to cater in uh, some private uh, fund. And if you cater in private fund in country like Africa, the majority of those countries, private fund cannot accept to be involved without the public sector being involved because those countries are very small and are using monopoly off taker, either state owned monopoly off taker or privately owned monopoly off taker. And if that is the case in the majority of countries in Africa, it means that the price of electricity is regulated. And if it is regulated, it means that the financial viability of the sector depends on how easy or not the government is able to set a price that will make the private investor be able to recover and make a profit. And if, if the government can do that, can the customer pay? And you will see that it is not always the case. Even if the government is willing to set a good market price, the customers or the majority of customers are not just able to pay, especially when we are talking about wind and solar, where we need to have feeding tariff. And if you have, we need to have a feeding tariff, it means that there is a subsidy behind. And if there are subsidies behind, can those government sustain the subsidy and for how long? Those government, they lack financial resources. Most of the time, they are highly indebted. So how can they continue to subsidize energy? Well, they are not even able to pay and to service their former debts. So you see that the issue of absorption capacity is very important. The first factor in this issue of absorption capacity is the financial viability of the energy sector. The second issue I have said is about regulation and the good public-private partnership in place that can help cater in a private finance in this sector. And that is why the narrative of asking for a special fund for Africa due to the fact that we are paying double penalties is to use this fund first to develop institutional capacity in terms of legal framework and PPP partnership framework, and second, to fund and to support the study or the development of feasibility study for bankable project using this special fund that will be made only mostly uh, in grant and then concessional loans. I would suggest 80% grants and 20% concessional loan. And this fund will be mainly for developing bankable feasibility studies in these countries that will help catch it in private sector through uh, open tender process to be transparent. So that is for the time being the, the first part of my contribution. So the second part of the contribution will complement the other factors of the absorption capacity. I think one of the speaker has already mentioned that because if we put priority in renewable energies like wind and solar, we need to be sure that the generation capacity already in place is able to absorb this type of energy, which are not stable. Because if you are putting a lot of solar and energy, it means that at the other hand, you are increasing also either the hydro or the thermal gas or thermal fuel power in the system to be able to regulate the, the uncertainties that you are introducing by these fluctuating energy sources. I think one of the speakers has already mentioned that. And I think for the time being, it will be better for me to stop there and give the opportunity for the other experts to contribute so that we can see where we are heading. Thank you so much. Uh, and and you're, you're kind of transitioning us to the practical realities of the finance part. Um, I see uh, Cody, um, who, who, who is going to really, uh, I, I believe he's going to really put um, 
you know, the, the lay of the land, uh, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, private sector needs to be involved, private sector needs to be involved. He has uh, extensive experience in, in working on upstream, midstream and downstream power infrastructure transactions. Uh, uh, and, and, and when you say, you know, bankable projects, what makes sense? I think Cody, uh, hopefully you'll be able to speak to that. I see Aruna, Anita and Musa, um, before we go into the, the, the nitty gritty of the financing, uh, would, would one of you uh, want to jump in? Uh, I think Musa, uh, the order was Musa, Anita and Aruna, but please feel free to, yeah. to jump in. Yeah, thank you, Bitsat. Actually, I wanted to jump on the on the idea of uh, capacity of absorbing the funds in our countries. What I want to highlight it uh, is a, a, a ground experience uh, here in terms of the implementation of uh, NDCs. As you already know, if a country wants to develop projects and implement its NDCs, first of all, in order to access, for instance, the Green Climate Fund uh, money, this country has to set up an accredited entities. And then after that, this accredited, ent uh, accredited entity has to develop bankable projects. And when they, they get the fund, they want to report to the Green Climate Fund. So from our ground experience, we realize that the difficulties are increasing from accreditation to development of uh, bankable projects to reporting. Very often people think that accreditation is a long process. It is a very uh, time consuming uh, process, but the reality is that once you get accredited in order to develop bankable projects, it is even more difficult. And the day you will get the money, it is even more difficult in order to report the, 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 on, the, on, the, on the use of that money. So this is why this difficulty in terms of reporting is putting additional burden in terms of absorption, absorption capacity from our institutions. So mm -hmm. that if you get the money, you are not able to absorb this money because you are not able to report on some of the criteria that the Green Climate Fund is putting in place. So as much as you do not have these criteria in place, you cannot report on the money. And if you cannot report on the money, then you cannot use it. So at the end, you have to bring it back to the Green Climate Fund. And I can tell you, we have recently heard the example of a bank. I'm not going to say the name of this bank in, in South Africa, uh, which has put back Green Climate Fund money just because they are not able to absorb the, the, this money. And why are they not able to absorb this money? It's just because they are not able to report on, 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 on this money. So. People are sometimes talking about access to finance. Access to finance may not be the most difficult. We have to look at all the different stages of the chain from the access to uh, uh, the reporting side as well. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, Bitsat, we can't hear you. You seem to be muted. Sorry. No, I said excellent point. Uh, you know, we the money might be there, but trying to get it, uh, the absorption capacity that uh, Charlemagne and Musa put in. And I think, Anita, you can say a lot on this because you are on the receiving end. So please uh, yeah. go ahead. So, so I think before we speak on the absor um, absorbing capacity, I think it's important we talk on uh, the ability to even attract the climate finance in the first place. Um, about 35 out of 50 of the largest financial institutions um, are now committed to investing in um, projects towards achieving net zero, right? But are the African countries um, able to attract this finance? Do they have the regulatory framework in place? Do they have the policies in place? Do they have data? Do they have geolo geological surveys, right? In order to um, 
identify materials that they could possibly use in uh, manufacturing a number of these renewable energy um, products within the African countries, right? Um, do they have, have they been able to demonstrate the political will in terms of using their own funding to develop or embark upon renewable energy projects? You know, these are um, a lot of um, aspects that African countries need to look at. Um, in Nigeria, they have taken bold steps and have um, you know, been able to secure a lot of um, finance from development partners such as World Bank and African Development Bank. Uh, one of the programs being the one that I had the Nigeria electrification project. And this was simply as a result of having, you know, many good regulations, for example, having those reg um, that regulatory framework, the policies, um, as much data as we could possibly provide. Um, yeah, these are, these are um, definitely things that, that uh, African countries need to work towards, towards being able to um, attract that finance in the first place. Thank you so much, Anita. Uh, Aruna, please jump in. Uh, oui, il y avait un. Là, je vois que vous, vous avez chuté sur uh, les aspects financiers. I see that you've uh, spoken about the IPCC, but uh, there is a, someone who passed a question about. Sorry, but the set, the sound quality is, is is very poor. It's difficult to interpret. I'd like to say that the elaboration of the NDCs is something that is coordinated by the the uh, Climate Change Convention. In every country, there is a team that was formed to draw this report, uh, but it's not done randomly there are methodologies that are composed and that must be adopted by all states and uh, they identify categories sectors transportation uh, forestry etc agriculture in the very broad sense and uh, as as estimation methods uh, and then they are uh, verified and that's how we come up with those figures of course there are reference situations as well and uh, that's where we have uh, difficulties uh, sometimes we have trouble in africa identifying reference situations to measure mitigation Having said this, with your permission, I'd like to say that uh, when you take the NDCs, you have agriculture, you have energy, which are sectors that are put forward. They take into account uh, uh, concerns which are not directly linked to climate. The only problem is that the challenges to pay taken up it's a question of uh, accelerating access to electricity as someone was saying you do this while limiting recourse to fossil fuels that's on the one hand and then on the other hand uh, you have to provide food security and encourage agriculture now uh, there are many uh, disparities between urban and rural areas in Africa, and 80% uh, of that population uses uh, traditional uh, fuels for cooking. And this is uh, a challenge. Now, what I wanted to say as well, with respect to transition, when we talk about transition, I believe that uh, we have to make sure that we don't make a mistake when it comes to the concept. From the point of view of knowledge, one of the major problems as well that uh, has their international reports. When it comes to the IPCC, it's important 
to have more experts. No, we have to keep that in mind as well. Having reports, conventions that are not, uh, that do not reflect the African reality. And the fact that many agreements that are signed by governments there is not enough African expertise. And we have to keep that in mind as well in order to encourage African scientists because there are many uh, research issues that we don't know when it comes to climate change, when it comes to adaptation. I call upon states I'm sorry, but the, the sound quality is, is very poor. It's very difficult to make out uh, the speaker. We um, are not at a point where we can talk about net zero. And everyone, someone said that for water, we need energy. So there's a great deal to be done and I think that Africa could be a champion when it comes to climate change if uh, there are financial resources. So that's what I wanted to say, roughly speaking. The point that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, and, and, uh, for, for, uh, I just can't get back. Um, thank you very much, Aruna, for 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 putting the that in in, in perspective um, i would like to uh, i see albert and and anita uh, albert if you want to go in yeah thank you bitsa I, I mean it's briefly to um, kind of contribute or respond to the issues raised by toby on the end, understanding real of the end we are talking about a uh, question of awareness also that was raised by uh, Anita and also discussion on the issue of uh, transition. Uh, we are talking about when uh, really the access is as low as it is uh, right now. So um, uh, look, and this is becoming interesting really from the contributions of everybody and it, indeed, and bits, I think this is also kind of indirectly touching the post COP26 on what really needs to be to be done, which I think is, is very important. And uh, I like a number of points that were raised, but before that, the issues of uh, NDCs, uh, Toby and the colleagues may come in, if I understood the, the, the issue well. So uh, countries have made uh, commitments and uh, have uh, set their own targets and, uh, you know, following the Paris Agreement. Now, the question here is how do they realize that? And uh, let me give you a practical example. So 2016-17, uh, uh, who I here was part of the team, I was leading a team that developed climate change policy. Uh, Lesotho climate change policy, strategy, action plan, even attempted to cost the action plan. Now that, which would uh, mainly also translate into the uh, achieving uh, or moving the uh, NEC roadmap that uh, we put in place, but also trying to uh, 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 mainstream the climate uh, resilience uh, actions into all the sectors of the economy, energy inclusive also being the uh, higher uh, emitting, emitting sector. Now, we set of actions in literally every sector that needs to be done. And this comes to the issue that was raised on the question of the readiness for absorptions or having the uh, bankable or literally clear transparent projects that need financing. This is the close to uh, five years down the road and uh, little has been done. Why? So um, you realize that, for example, take agriculture, or take forestry, which contributes to that. 
And uh, this uh, uh, department that is responsible for uh, climate change mitigations and adaptations mechanisms and trying to uh, discuss with different sectors, they convene meetings and uh, all high level actually, uh, directors from uh, these respective sectors will come and sit together and they plan on what needs to be done. And once they get back, they'll go to their routines, fundamental conventional agriculture and water and health and forestry, period. They'll meet again and so on and so forth. And we said, okay, you know what? To achieve this, like countries send ambassadors to different countries to stand in for their own interests. You send your people to sit in these different sectors to be there, but being your people, you pay them. They are there to make sure that they push the climate change uh, responsive agenda in those respective uh, uh, sectors. Is it done? So, I leave it there. So, literally, uh, here. So, so, uh, Toby, these are these are the issues uh, that uh, we're talking about when we talk about NDCs. So, these sectors are going to come up with the actions, and mitigation measure, measures are going to be put in place, and mitigation actions, and uh, the quantities are going to be established of the uh, of, of the greenhouse gases that will be emitted or that will be re reduced or avoided. And that together, comprehensive, then the countries are able to form the projected, the projections of the greenhouse gases emission reduction for a period of time. And that is it. And through that, they write the, what they call communication reports so or by annual reports that they send up there in response to these commitments. I can tell you that as of last year, countries that had made commitments by for 2020, it's the three countries in Africa that were able to produce the report, leave alone realization of the actions. So this touches the question of, uh, but before I come to that, the question of uh, awareness, uh, 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 Anita, this is also tricky because it, it, it's all these sectors together and there is no single sector, even tourism, even uh, gender, even call it, which is independent of climate change effects and actions. And these are sectors that are responsible to put mechanisms, visibility, communications, and to be able to inform the respective uh, stakeholders, including people at the grassroots le levels. Are they doing it? That's something different. So this takes me to the question um, colleagues raised of the absorption, which is very, very important. The absorption capacity, we are talking about uh, uh, projects, but take governments, really, government, the level of government. So all these things we are discussing, I'm pretty sure they've been discussed and they are being discussed in the COP26. The key issue is post that, what's gonna happen? So let's say, assume the monies are there, are availed in this as, as it was put, put, put in. So how uh, is it going to be consumed if there are no clear transparent actions that are going to meet also the requirement of this financing? There, there won't be an organization or agents that is going to bring a chunk of money and put in the central bank of a country and say, go ahead and uh, meet your uh, indices or meet your targets. Never. There, there will be always conditions and so on and so forth. So first of all, ourselves in the house, we need to be clear. We need to be ready. We need to have clear, transparent, focused actions quantified timelines and everything that respond to this question we are discussing about. That is one, as a government. But also, I think this was raised also by Musa or another colleague to say, there is no way government will be able to achieve uh, to execute these, these actions. We need clouding in private sector, but private sector, how does it come in? And these are two levels. There is a high level, big companies that will go to conventional banks. And that's what uh, uh, those are such companies that Toby is happy to deal with because they come, they know how to put projects together. They know how to negotiate and transact and get the money, get that money. But when you're talking about this cast of people Anita was talking about, these are people that will be saved by off-grid solutions, mini-grids, micro-grids, uh, solar home systems, and these needs small, medium enterprises that are able to go there and be able to do that. These are the companies that are victims of not accessing financing. And conventional banks never work. Conventional financing never work in terms of uh, financing because they are not ready, they don't know, they are not aware that such kind of projects are long-term, they are delicate, in some cases unpredictable to be able to 
get to understand the language of the borrower and be able to assist him accordingly. So what, what do we need in that case? For example, I see really if we are serious, we have to uh, be able to save this sector, sub sector. We need also to come up with encouraging and uh, introducing microfinancing, small, small finance institutions and provide guarantee fund and be able to assist build capacity that are going to provide simple, easy loans to the companies. I'm not saying they should give free money to the project that uh, don't have a direction, no. But at least there's flexibility. There is listening to the borrowers, which is not being done by current by the big uh, conventional banks at, at that level. This is something that we need to literally be able to look at. Now, even back to the higher level, this conventional financing architecture, take even World Bank, let's say, monies that right now, and uh, these commitments of uh, these developed countries, they are uh, putting a lot of money in the World Bank, European Investment Bank, and so, and so forth, say, okay, assist Africa. If they go conventionally, you know how to transact with the World Bank with none objections, the stages, and they, and they realize the uh, uh, disbursement, to reach the disbursement, disbursement level. If we go that way, again, definitely, we shall not be able to get the impact in the time we need. So these are, these are situations that we as countries need to sit down and be able to look at a, you know, holistically and be able to come up with the, uh, actions, strategies that will be able to work. Something me and you can never do, can never work on. Obviously by the end of the day, it's like each car has a old driver, depends on a driver, a, a policymaker, a, a head of state, a prime minister, by the end of the day, the country agenda, the actions by the ministers and everything will be driven by the direction of the leaders. Such level of commitment is needed, is required. Where countries are committed, committed policy, you have seen it, it works. Where it doesn't exist or focuses in a different direction, it's hard, however you may try. Let me stop there. This, uh, this this puts the the fire on on, on Cody uh, Cody then Anita please please jump in uh, you have uh, you have high stakes in defending the private sector thanks um, <clears throat> and thanks um, I'll start with thank you um, Albert for for um, basically answering my my other question and also Aruna uh, as well Mr Bugu Palafranche. Um, so, look, I, I think in terms of when we look at the private sector, in terms of, I guess, call it sustainable finance for, for renewables, um, I'll start with, with the role of, of the public sector, because that also plays a, a massive role in all of this. And, and I'll start with, if I do a very quick comparison with my former life. Um, so 2006, I was based in the UK, and that was when the renewable space really kicked off. Um, in the UK. And it was very clear that the UK government put in place very clear incentives to assist meeting its targets. It was very clear. And also there was a clear regulatory framework in place. So my, my view in terms of the public sector is to put in place the enabling frameworks, infrastructure, and also to a certain degree incentives to attract the private sector, right? Um, and, that, and that was done, and that was very clear. And, that, and that's why you've seen, you saw the sort of explosion of renewables across, across Europe, because of those incentives that were put in place. Um, and it was a clear direction that was put in place. Now, if I switch to coming into, into Africa, and, and I guess to Albert's point, which I'll quickly answer, and, and it's a valid point. It is genuinely a valid, valid point in the sense of that, if you look at the conventional banks, Conventional banks are typically used to dealing with large developers, you know, structured bankable projects. But before we get to them, from a public sector perspective, there's also the sustainability of policy. You know, we live in, a, in an environment, certainly from an Africa perspective, whereby ultimately governments change, people change. You know, there's one, there's, there's a lot of different competing priorities at the end of the day. And each country has its own set of competing priorities. And if you look at it, you know, is renewables really top of the agenda? I would probably argue not, right? 
Um, <clears throat> the reality is that, you know, when, when people think of industrialization, when you think of, okay, what's the next path for my country, it's really around, and someone touched on it very earlier, is, is actually access to electricity. That's really the starting point. We want our people to actually have the access to electricity first. I don't think people really care whether it's, gonna, it's coming from thermal, whether it's coming from renewables, whether it's coming from whatever. It's really around access to electricity. And that's really the starting point. So there are very, very different competing priorities around that. Now, there was also a mention of, of PPPs and, and, I, and I like the idea of, you know, around the special fund for renewables or special fund for Africa, which I'd also like to, you know, have that conversation on, on later. But the, the reality is that there is not enough, I think from on the, on the private sector side, there's not enough of, a, of an incentive because the reality is that the private sector will always, will always follow where, where money is to be made, right? Or where there's a where there is profit to be made, or where it is attractive, and if I look at the number of projects, and and you know I spend my daily life looking at various projects across you know various different countries, um, different types of developers, and what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to move away from the traditional. Let's look at the big developers to actually thinking around mini grids and captive power. Um, we haven't done as much as I would have liked, I would like, to be honest with you, but I think for me, if I look at it, that's really the future. So if you look at a country like Nigeria, it is really going to be around mini grids and capital power. That, we, you know, that I'm very, very convinced is the future. Um, what is limiting, what is, the, what is the limiting factor in terms of attracting the private sector capital apart from the public sector? One is these projects take time. If you look at a big, Big sort of if, if somebody's saying, okay, I want to do a 150 megawatt solar project, and it starts today, <clears throat> your child will finish private school by that by the time that project is built. If you have if you have the child at the same time, so if you give birth to a child today, the guy starts his renewables project today, your child most likely will be almost finishing primary school by the time that project is, and I'm talking COD, the pro, not not getting the money by the time the project is up and running generating power right your child in some cases actually your child might even be in secondary school if you look at a project like lake tokana which is you know largest wind project in africa that took 13 years from when it started to when it actually started to generate power so the time it it, it takes just far too long it takes far too long you know unfortunately from an africa perspective it's you know, there's this, and it's interesting, there's this risk premium that is placed on Africa, which is a very interesting risk premium. And what do I mean by the risk premium? One is the risk premium that the private sector participants place on Africa. So private sector will typically tend to want to take outsized profits, sometimes upfront, before the project is even up, they want to take the outsized profits. You look at the banks itself, Right, both the both the local banks and both the what I would call the regional banks and the risk premium that we place on doing business in Africa. You know, we sit there, we do analysis paralysis, and I've also and, you know, and, I, and I've been very clear on this, even from an internal perspective. We do analysis paralysis and we dream up risks that may or may not happen. Some do, some don't, but we we come up with these amazing risks that may or may not happen. You look at the advisors that are involved and the number of advisors that are involved. And they also dream up risks that may or may not happen. Then you then decide, and for whatever reason, we decide as Africa that we want to overlay everything with whether it's a DFI involvement. So whether it's whether we say, okay, we want the IFC to be involved, we want the World Bank without with the mega policies, we want all of these things. So by the time you overlay all of these things, you are now talking about something that maybe should have taken maybe one, two years. It now takes four to five years. So it's a huge inhibitor. Uh, you know, private sector, there, there was this 2008, there was this incredibly sort of almost this buzz with the private sector that actually, you know, we want to do projects in Africa. But the reality is that the projects that have come online, the time is taken. And then when it does come online, you then get almost this non-ownership of these projects. So these projects almost become, so the new government comes in, the new government then says, actually, we didn't, we didn't do this. 
we we didn't do this. It wasn't our. It was the last government. And by the way, it's really really expensive power, and we're not going to pay for it. So <clears throat> it makes it difficult. So there's this real, there's this real sort of almost. I, I've noticed a massive drop off in the number of projects that the private sector is willing to do over the past four to five years, which is a huge change. It's been a massive drop off, and the reality is that how do we stimulate that interest how do we stimulate that investment from the private sector side but it cannot but but we have to do it in such a way that the reality is that it's not what's going to cure the deficit in power it's not at the end of the day you know is renewables is not going to bridge the deficit in, in nigeria for example right it's not going to bridge deficit in in Cote d'Ivoire. it's not going to bridge deficit in a lot of countries, it's, it's not. It's maybe only in South Africa where they're doing that, where it might bridge deficit, but it's not gonna bridge that deficit in most African countries. So there needs to be almost one, an enabling environment to attract private sector capital. And I, and I do get dismayed when I hear certain develop, development finance institutions saying that they, know, they, know, they won't even look at gas, which I find quite shocking. Um, so there needs to be this acknowledgement to say that, you know what, renewables is not going to it's not going to solve the problem. It is not, and if you know one, we need to create an enabling environment for investment in in power in general for Africa in general, and to the extent that we want to go one step above, or one step beyond, and say we want to more incentivize renewables, then there needs to be that clear incentive for everybody. There needs to be a clear incentive for the public sector to do it, which right now I don't really know what it is. Um, hence my question around the NDCs and really wanting to understand what really goes behind it, because I, I, I don't get a sense that there really is, a, is an incentive for the public sector, because the incentive just shouldn't sit with the private sector. The public sector should also be incentivized to do it as well. There needs to be the support for the public sector to do it. So if you look at other countries, you know, they have, you know, they have tons of advisors. They have people advising them, people giving them direction. People, there needs to be that support for the public sector to get to get things done. Um, and then for on the on the private sector side, they also need to be incentivized. And that incentive incentive might come through some sort of special, some sort of special fund for these types of renewables. But I guess before I ask the question, I mean, I've had various conversations around with various institutions. I won't name names around some of these types of funds. And what I find is that these funds sit with certain multilaterals and these organizations. Me sitting opposite those guys, by the time I finish that conversation, I'm like, because I know that to get money out of that, so if a fund is created and it's sitting there, to get those funds out of that and to be deployed, the amount of time that it takes, you might have missed the window. So. Either you turn around and say, okay, we're going to have this fund. We're going to be very clear that this is the, this is the criteria. And if you meet the criteria, we will deploy the funds within six months or whatever. Or just don't have it at all. Because the amount of time you people spend sitting down, talking, providing information, that kind of stuff, it discourages investors um, to actually do it. It takes a lot of, you know, what I always say, it takes a lot of resilience to to develop these projects. And the reality on both sides, on both the public sector side and the private sector side, it, rely, it requires a huge amount of resilience, which the reality is not, not a great, not everybody has, which is why we've seen such low uptick in terms of power, power adaptation over the past couple of years. It's, it, it, it's just very, it's just a challenge and it's just difficult. So I think, Albert, I think you're, I think you are right in the sense of the fact that historically, and it's also a learning period. Historically, commercial banks have not played in this space. But the reality is that we are now being forced, certainly my bank, we are being forced to play. Um, some of us have always had an interest, but we are really now being forced to play by our shareholders. We get asked questions around, what are you doing from a sustainable finance perspective? What transactions are you doing? What projects are you involved in for, from a sustainable um, finance perspective? Um, and it's very clear that there is that clear scorecard. So hopefully, that will definitely attract more private sector capital. But I do believe that there's quite a bit of work to be done um, on, the, on the public sector side and the private sector side to harmonize 
because we don't have that in Africa. We don't have that harmonization um, on both sides. So I'll stop there. Um, but I'm still curious around the around the special the special fund for renewables. I, I'm 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 curious in terms of that, and then also in terms of the absorption capacity as well, because I think that was a that was an interesting um, conversation as well, because that is a clear limiting factor. So so that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, as always, uh, Cody, thank you for the for the sobering perspectives. Um, uh, I guess I, I'm going to, uh, Anita and Aruna um, have asked for the floor. So Anita, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Bitsat. And uh, also just to also thank uh, Toby Selling Bank have actually been pretty influential in Nigeria's concerns, uh, supporting our mini grid uh, companies in Nigeria. They have literally been at the forefront. And uh, we find that a lot of the commercial banks are somewhat catching up now um, as uh, Selling Bank has taken um, that leap of faith, if we put it like that. Um, he'd also mentioned the issue concerning Africa um, having this risk premium placed on it. And uh, my understanding in terms of addressing uh, these risks or how government can really address it is by um, providing this blended finance sort of opportunity. So for, for example, with the Nigeria electrification project, the fact, the fact that we provide uh, grant subsidies to these mini grid developers, it gives a level of comfort to these commercial banks knowing that um, they're guaranteed of a, a significant amount of money coming back to them. Um, so it's important that we do that. Um, I think also the issue concerning um, not being able to attract local currency uh, debt, right? Most of the financiers are, are international and um, you're getting loans in probably dollars. And, and meanwhile, you as a developer, you're receiving your funds from the end consumers in the local currency. And then with the fluctuations and everything, you know, it, it, it doesn't make this business attractive. You know, and we need to make this business attractive in order for us to achieve that universal access using these uh, renewable energy projects. I guess my question would be to Toby, how do we, you know, how do we address um, these risks that um, prevent commercial banks, both local or international banks, um, from providing that local uh, currency debt um, that's needed in um, embarking on climate-friendly related projects. Thank you, Anita. Before we go back to Cody, um, Aruna, um, please uh, jump in. And uh, for the interpreters, uh, just in, if you can uh, speak closer to the mic. Thank you. OK, OK. Uh, très bien. Merci pour... Uh... Pour toutes ces, ces interventions. Thank you for all the statements that have been made and the contributions. Musa has reminded us that a large part of the NDCs have to be funded by own resources. This is something that is often not said. And today, if we look at what has been done, and this has been done during COP26, when we look at where we stand in our commitments. So if we take stock, we are still very far. I would like to encourage our states to implement our NDCs with our own resources instead of looking for external funding, which is extremely complicated. It's, ex it's complicated to absorb them within the system. We have to implement measures that are beneficial to adaptation and mitigation. Measures to improve quality of water and air is good for the planet, but it is first good for our own population, our biodiversity, and of course, for achieving the SDGs beyond the matters of climate change. So inclusive actions have to be taken within our own scope. I believe that it is by adding all these little solutions at the city level, at the commune level, at the region level, these little contributions are what will lead to great change. There are concrete measures that could be taken like progressive elimination of uh, wood for fuel, 
and the use of charcoal. Somebody spoke of natural gas. I believe that this sector should not be neglected. Let us not get onto a debate that does not apply to the African reality. I understand that we are moving away from carbon, but using natural gas, which redu which reduce, sorry produces less emissions than the rest, is good for Africa. And gas is flexible enough to deal with the intermittencies that we face during renewable energy use that somebody raised here. As for the private sector, let me use Cote d'Ivoire's example, which has put in place a tax reduction mechanism for enterprises that fund research in environment matters. These are the kind of examples that we could encourage to be applied in our, in our system. Reducing taxes is useful for businesses. So this is in general what I wanted to say. We need to support research and innovation within African institutions. There are solutions that can be put in place, but we have to support research, especially in green hydrogen. So in general, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, oh. Sorry, uh, I had to, uh, I had it on French. Uh, I just wanted to say that you, you bring a very key point in that when we say public sector, just like Albert broke down, you know, private sector is two different state steps. You said, when we say public sector, it is from community, it is from cities, it is on multiple aspects that we have to integrate this. It's not just, we talked a lot about political prioritization and incentive for the public sector. Um, it, we don't have to look at it just solely from the ministry or for, from the very large top uh, levels of government. We have to go into local government, local communities, and then build up and those collective efforts will build up to, uh, to bring something bigger, um, bigger in the picture. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, Cody, I think um, you have Anita's question, um, and then um, you know, as we as we are finishing off, uh, I just want um, all of you to 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 kind of think about what you know what what you would like the key points to be if you if you'd like to summarize in your own words. What uh, initially I thought I would summarize everything, but. You, from from your perspectives, if you could just summarize the key points um, after Cody, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and thanks, um, th thanks, Bessa. Um, so, in terms of, and, and I guess before I get onto Anita's question, and I haven't forgotten it, um, some interesting points that I want to raise. Um, one was around around gas. You know, and we are seeing in, in, in its own way, this adaptation is happening, but, I don't, but it's not really happening because it, it's happening partly because of climate change, but it's just happening naturally. So the switch from, for example, very simple, the switch from, for example, kerosene to LPG. And that's, that's a switch that, that, is, that is happening. And if you look at certain countries, you know, Nigeria, Ghana, West African countries, for example, where that's gas rich, people are realizing, actually, can we, use, can we actually use this gas? It's been sitting there for forever and a day. We've been flaring it, right? So if you look at what's been, what's, you know, if you maybe ten years ago, if you flew over a certain part of certain part of Nigeria, especially on the east side, you'll see just flares everywhere. And actually, people are starting to realize that we can actually use that and actually create something like, for example, LPG, which can then feed into the domestic ecosystem and be utilized based purely on a natural resource that we have. And those types of projects are happening and they're happening. And we've seen a massive uptick in those, in those types of projects in terms of utilizing natural gas. Then on the other part of the, around the NDCs, and again, thanks again. And, and the rationale to my question around the NDCs was the fact that 
On the private sector side, private sector gets a lot of confidence knowing that the government is going to uphold those NDCs. And I've seen it in a former life. Private sector gets a lot of confidence from that. And if I'm honest, I, as I sit here today, and maybe it's my, my I, I still don't, if someone asks me, what's the NDC of Ghana? I can't tell you, I have no idea what it is. Um, I don't know what Ghana is committed to. I don't know how Ghana committed to that. I don't really know why Ghana committed to that. So I can't say whether Ghana will definitely commit or Nigeria or one country will say they're definitely gonna to commit to achieving 3%. Whereas, and I know this is very Africa, whereas let's say if Germany turns around and says we're going to do X, Y, and Z, the private sector gets quite comfortable with that fact. And they get quite comfortable knowing that, yeah, they're, you know, we can see it, it's written down, we can see the, see the policy document or whatever the document is that says that these guys are going to commit to, to this, right? So for, <clears throat> and that's also the starting point, that we on the private sector side, we actually don't know what it is. So, you know, if Cote d'Ivoire, you know, this is literally, and I'll be very honest, this is the first proper conversation. I'd heard in the, up in the sky that, yes, there are NDCs that African countries commit to, but this is the first time I've actually had people explain to me the methodology, how it got there, and potentially what those numbers look like. Because we have absolutely no idea. So there's a, there's a disconnect, right? There's a clear disconnect between, on one side, certain things have been agreed to and certain things have been potentially adopted but on the other side no one knows why and no one knows what those are so again i would also urge that to the extent that certain things do get agreed to by african countries from this cop 26 that they're actually made available and people actually see what they are and the, the methodology behind it and why and you know is it actually possible right because also Let's say Cote d'Ivoire goes and agrees to a certain NDC. People are quite smart. They'll be able to figure out very quickly that mm, this is not going to happen. And, and how is, that, is it actually going to happen? And really, what does that mean on a quantitative perspective in terms of the amount of investment that's actually required to achieve that? Um, so that, that for me is the, is, you know, and that was why I was so interested in that question, because to me, it's quite fascinating. Um, then to try to answer, um, Anita's question around local currency financing. Look, I totally agree with you. I think for that's one of the inhibiting factors. Um, Long-term infrastructure should always be funded by local currency finance completely. And <clears throat> if I were to talk to Nigeria specifically, I mean, the central bank is trying to put in place, I mean, they've put in place the DCR, um, the concessionary um, rates in terms of long-term funding to, to basically utilize local currency capital to fund long-term projects. But the difficulty with these things is that it's, it, it's, it can be opaque, right? So it's done by the banks. We take it through our processes, we approve it, but to get that money out of the central bank is a different story. Um, and that has its own challenges as well. So, so the funding is available and it's clear and the policy is there. You know, it's, it's 9%, you can have it for up to 15 years. It exists, banks are doing it. I know people who have gotten access to those funds, but with all these things, it's not as straightforward as it seems. Um, so yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for for that. Uh, we are nearing our um, our closing time. I mean, for me, I could talk about this all day, uh, um, but I just wanted to give each of you the floor. Um, to kind of, um, you know, have a, a wrap up last minute thoughts of, 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 of how we can go forward. Um, you know, the salient points that you want to get across. Um, Anita, if I can start with you. Thank you, uh, being the only woman on the panel. <laughs> okay, so first of all, um, it's important to mention that climate change is real. Um, irrespective of whether Africa is a continent um, uh, contributed majorly to the adverse effects of climate change. It is real and it will impact us all. And so uh, Africa as a continent needs to also play its part, needs to play a role in um, this whole energy transition plan. However, with that being said, um, in determining the NDCs, um, the deadline, special consideration has to be given to Africa in view of its peculiarities, in view of the fact that the significant 
um, portion of its citizens, you know, are in poverty, are without um, access, basic access to power, water, good education, good health care, and the likes. Um, in order for, for us to achieve socioeconomic development, um, these considerations really need to be given, um, as opposed to putting them side by side with, uh, I guess, the Western world. Um, when we're uh, accessing climate finance from um, you know, our international counterparts, we want low interest loans. We want local currency debt. We want job creation. Like we don't just want to import uh, this renewable energy infrastructure from outside of, of the continent into Africa. We need to build our own manufacturing plants. We want to be able to build these batteries, um, not just assemble the, P, uh, the uh, solar PV um, panels, but to actually manufacture them from scratch, you know, and we need that support. We need that training. Um, we also need sensitization as well for our people. For them to really understand um you know the issues around climate change and from the public perspective or from the private perspective is for our, our governments to to also create that enabling environment too they need to provide that legal framework or regulatory framework they need to have the policies in place they need to have the data you know so we know where to 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 um bridge the energy access deficit with renewable energy projects um you know, they need to provide a blended finance in order to address uh, the, the risks that are that come with investing in projects in Africa. Um, and so that's essentially it for me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Aruna, uh, you, I know you might have to go in, in two, three minutes if you want to do uh, your closing thoughts. You have the floor. Would like to thank um, all of you for this uh, roundtable and uh, I was listening to Anita's com statement and she talked about inclusive solutions. Now, I would uh, opt in favor of her research and I would say research is not finest enough and you're in touch with deciders try to see how you can get universities African universities involved in research but today we have to develop African solutions and we have to target those priorities now you can't continue to do energy transfers, that's not enough. You have to update all of that. And even uh, transfers, it needs a bit of science in our region. That's the first thing. The second thing, I come back to the fact that we shouldn't use uh, words such as carbon neutral, etc. We need energy to develop. We have to be realistic. In an African context, you can't imagine development as in differently from what is happening in European countries. There are aspects in research. There's research in biogas and energy from agricultural residue. There's a huge potential there that hasn't been explored. And there is a green hydrogen. We speak very little about that. Africa has a role to play in that area. So we need a strategic investment on research and development there. And obviously public and private investment, but at the institutional level, but also at the local level to implement with the private sector solutions that would contribute both to adaptation and mitigation. So. I'm very happy to have taken part in this uh, discussion, and I thank you for having organized this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, if uh, if I can call on um, on Albert, if, if he's still here, uh, to do some closing thoughts. Uh, bits that you are you are. Uh, 
uh, your voice is really low. Did, did you mention? Yes, Zelda? I said uh, if, if you would like oh. to do some closing, uh, yeah, some closing sure. thoughts. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I really wish to commend uh, the initiative of uh, you and Ndidi uh, on this and uh, really bringing us together and networking. And uh, we get to know, we get to get to get to virtual friends here and probably we're gonna meet in person. So thank you very much. I think this is important. So um, uh, two major uh, concluding remarks from me. One is really focus, actually what, focusing on post COP26 pathway, you know, so, and this constitutes two elements to um, my thinking. One is the African countries through the African Union Commission to put up a follow-up mechanism to ensure developed countries execute their pledges. Okay, one, two, the same African countries to prepare a post COP26 clear and concise action plan, focusing on two major things. One, under the public undertakings to make sure those countries don't have, that don't have NDCs roadmaps to make sure they develop them. Uh, I may differ a little bit with my colleagues to say this, they may use uh, own financing. They, they These countries, have issues, competing priorities that uh, uh, it might really be difficult if they don't, they want to come up with really serious informed uh, and see roadmaps with the uh, stati clear statistics, statistics and data and everything. That is one. So uh, number two, uh, uh, and, and these roadmaps sh sh should have really clear uh, climate change uh, mainstreaming uh, actions in different uh, sectors of the economy. And uh, I believe this is where probably the country, the entire country will get to uh, have the information to understand what is happening, also following the concerns that were raised by Toby and uh, Anita. And another major thing is the strategy of clouding in the private sector involvement. A conducive investment environment has been uh, talked about, but also, for example, using the same financing from uh, developed countries, for example, on the Tobis like banks, for example, to get the uh, guarantee funds that will assist them to cushion some risks and probably be able to reduce transaction uh, costs. Such big banks will still be needed, big projects will be there. So, um, um, I think they need to be supporting their own ways to be able to move on uh, and to get encouraged to be able to be involved in such kind of arrangements and uh, then support um, the establishment of microfinancing institutions, small banks, local banks, you know, that are able to uh, provide loans to small and medium enterprises really that are flexible, that are, yeah, that are flexible and uh, be able to go through a very uh, low or short transaction path in order to uh, ensure that these activities are done. When I talk about the commitment the governments to come together, if you go to Scotland right now, many governments have sent people from the head of state to the ministers, to the permanent secretaries, to technocrats. When they come back, they, <laughs> they don't sit together again to uh, now craft the, you know, the, the pathway on what needs to be done positive, you know, so that the kind of commitment I'm, I'm uh, kind of talking about. Thank you very much. And uh, also thank you everybody on the panel. And uh, uh, Toby, you can be sure I'm coming soon. <laughs> borrow money from you. So I'll be able I think, to convince you after this discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Um, if I can call on Musa, Charlemagne, uh, any any closing thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bitsats. Uh, let me jump uh, now and uh, please let me put it uh, in French this time. So I have uh, put the settings on French language. Uh, bien sûr.
Et donc, je voulais vraiment souligner deux points pour finir ici. I wanted to make out a, a couple of points to conclude. The first point uh, is to support uh, what was said by Aruna when it comes to research. I think it's a crucial point. Today, when you take the example of renewable energy, we know the classic photovoltaic energy. But when you look at Europe, they've invented a panoply of solar panels, double-faced solar panels, the solar panels that uh, operate in the at nighttime that you can combine with agriculture. And when you take other technologies, it's a whole area of extraordinary research that Africa has an opportunity to seize. Because when you talk about solar energy, there is nothing like Africa, the resources here. And um, I'm disappointed when you look at solar batteries that are not very effective and with a lot of toxic waste because it comes from the outside. All of that comes from the outside because we ourselves have not developed it. We have not done research, sustainable research. But when you do poor quality research, you have poor quality resources and that discourages our population from using renewable energies because it's of poor quality. And we've uh, spoken about the efficiency of uh, solar panels of uh, 25%, but Africa has a potential to uh, develop a, a much more effective solar panels. So research is crucial and we have to promote research. We have to promote uh, independent research and avoid the importing of concepts that are not very relevant for Africa. And there's that uh, concept uh, of carbon neutral development. Uh, in Africa, many of our countries are still not developed. Uh, so how can we become uh, carbon neutral? I think it's not realistic. We also, we also talk about uh, energy transition. Many of our countries don't even have access to energy. How can we talk about uh, the tra energy transition in our countries? So we have to think about uh, uh, the basis for research, or research which is relevant for our countries and where we can uh, produce uh, resources which are uh, important for the development of our countries. Uh, I also wanted uh, to talk about the uh, private sector. It's interesting for us uh, when we've had uh, a chance to look at uh, more than 10 uh, COPs uh, and they say it's not ethic, it's not moral to have uh, the private sector intervening in adaptation to climate change, for example. And they say that uh, because there is a common and differentiated responsibility. Why uh, should we do a business with adaptation? But things have changed a lot. Things have changed a great deal in present time. We see that the uh, private sector can play a crucial role when it comes to climate change. And we have to promote the local private sector because it's that local private sector. If we support it, it will be the basis for socioeconomic development to, that Africa so crucially needs. It will be at the basis of uh, uh, firms and uh, involved in climate change with a great many opportunities. It, it means creating uh, several firms. Why don't we create firms around uh, each uh, of these areas of adaptation, but especially promote uh, the local private sector? I think that's crucial. Thank you. Thank you so much, Musa um, Charlemagne, before I... Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, put my closing words, I would like to come back and try to share my thought on the issue that were raised by the banker. Uh, he said that we should develop more the financial system uh, to be able to, for financial system to finance project, long-term finance. 
uh, by developing capital market or bond market. I think it is very important we should emphasize that. And uh, also uh, in the entering period, we should mention that while waiting for this full development of the financial sector, there are some innovative solutions that have been developed by the World Bank. For example, they experienced it in the hydro project in Cameroon, where the local banks were crowded in, but the local banks, due to the regulation, cannot loan for more than seven years because they, are, they have short-term deposit, and then they cannot use short-term deposit to fund long-term projects. Then they, they were crowded in with a mechanism whereby they give loan for seven years, but at the end of the seven years, there is a possibility for the government to buy the loan. And this commitment by the government is backstopped by the World Bank. In case the government, at the end of the seven years, is not able to buy the loan if the local bank is willing to get out the project, then the government is obligated to buy in. And if the government is not able to do that, the World Bank will do that. And they can do that for every seven years until 21 years, the time duration to fund a hydro project. So there are some innovative solutions that we can put in place to crowd it in local bank, even if they have some constraint about financing long-term projects. The other issue that I would like to share is related to the local currency. Uh, I have heard that you want to, 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 to emphasize uh, the implementation of local currency in those projects to be able not to jeopardize the current account and the international reserve at the World Bank. I think this is possible, it is difficult, it is possible, but the limitation is that for those long-term projects, the local content possibility is also limited because you will be importing machineries and capital goods, and those technologies are not manufactured locally. So at the end of the day, for those projects, it is very difficult to move around more than 30% of local content or national content, to use the right word, national content, because inside the country you have local community content, which, are, which is another issue. But in terms of national content, it is for those projects, in the energy sector, it is very difficult to go beyond 30%. But even then, 30% is almost a good thing. The last issue that were raised by the discussion around uh, getting in the private finance is related to risk. So I think that several categories of risk, we can say that we have general sovereign risk, which is uh, there for every type of project, not only for renewable project, sovereign risk. And to solve that issue, basically, private finance, they prefer to get in the, the involvement of a multilateral bank to solve the issue of sovereign risk. But there are some renewable energy specific risk because we don't know if this project will be uh, sustainable because of the feeding tariff. Maybe the government will not be able to, 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 to keep its uh, commitment regarding the subsidies. And then you have also some example of innovative solution developed what they call the first loss capital. We have the example of uh, Turkaya, uh, Lake Turkaya Wing Project in Kenya where the African Development Bank, I think, come in with a solution of uh, uh, first loss capital. So that possibility said that for every private investor willing to invest, they are secure by the fact that the first loss will be absorbed by the African Development Bank. So those are the solutions that can be implemented to tackle the renewable energy specific risk apart from the sovereign risk. So that was the idea that I wanted to share before giving my concluding words. So my concluding word is that the priority in Africa, or especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is that we have access to energy issue. So the priority is to give access to energy to population, whether it is renewable or not. The second issue we have in sub-Saharan Africa and maybe in other countries in Africa is that we have absorption capacity. So if we don't remove those limitations, 
we will not be able to complete the objective many countries are putting in their NDCs. The third issue is that Africa is paying twice the price. We are not the one polluting. The statistics are there to show that. But we are the ones suffering the most because more than 60% of our population live in agriculture, in rural area, and they are the most affected by climate change. And they are the ones that they are asked to, to bear the cost of transition. So we need the people who have created this problem to put money on the table so that we can use that money to do two things. First, to fund the bankable feasibility studies for renewable project. And second, to put in place good regulation and good public-private partnership system in place to make sure that we are going to capture in private sector to help develop these projects. And then, and finally, I think for Africa, uh, the issue is not necessary to meet optimistic or realistic target on NDCs. I think the issue is really to start and we have not yet started globally. Thank you, that was my last words. Thank you very much um, again for 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 uh, for for that concluding remarks and and for the very key points on that. Um, before I give the 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 floor to Cody uh, for some um, closing thoughts, uh, I just want to point out that we've been missing uh, Al Khali Konde, one of our um, one of our panelists. Unfortunately, he's been having really terrible uh, connection issues and was not able to take the floor, but he did send me um, some of the points that he wanted to make. So I'll just, I'll just summarize them. Uh, Cody, would you like to go first before I do that? And then we conclude? No, go ahead, go summarize. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put this up, just give me a second. Um, so uh, he says that he really appreciates the diverse contributions um, and the, di the diverse uh, perspective, uh, uh, perspectives. And he, he notes that to tackle all the diverse problems and challenges, we need to focus on the following to avoid scattering of actions because there's many different avenues that we can take. But if we don't consolidate and if we don't um, do it step by step, uh, we may lose focus. So he notes that we must be focused on institutional development and capacity and capability building. Uh, he said the la this landscape should be uh, scaled up and he proposes six points. Uh, he says, first of all, as, as Albert, as you mentioned, you know, within our own ministries, uh, you know, having the diverse opportunities identifying them and then having those speak as one voice to the political actors. Uh, for, for countries uh, um, in terms of financing, uh, he, he suggests that uh, setting up sovereign national funds, especially with countries that have natural resources, make it, uh, you know, when, when the private uh, sector comes in, make it automatic that a percentage goes into these sovereign um, national sovereign funds so that they can be used uh, as part of the 15% contribution that Musa was uh, speaking about. Um, then the third one is, you know, within the African Development Bank, for example, set up, uh, you know, set up an easily, uh, relatively easily accessible energy environment and inf infrastructure financing that uh, that's really uh, available to both the private sector and the public sector. Um, he also sets up, uh, gives an example of an organization OLADE in Latin America, uh, which is a trans uh, transcontinental for uh, in this case for um, uh, for uh, Latin America uh, to set up something for Africa, especially in terms of putting the word out there, uh, you know, making sure that everybody knows what the country has committed to 
and and uh, and what is required from you know tailored requirements for each sector, whether it's from the population, or or uh, the public sector or the private sector. Uh, we can open and scale up the internal capital of national electricity companies to compel them to improve governance and, and maximize uh, performance. This is, I guess, uh, speaking to the transparency aspect of how utilities are run uh, and the transparency um, in, 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 in their finances, et cetera. And then the sixth point is every country in Africa must reinforce the monitoring and rating of the performance of the diverse organizations involved in the energy services. Again, I think this brings us back to, you know, the ministries working together as one. First, basically setting up our own house uh, before we can um, we can we can try to tap into whatever resources uh, that exist. So thank you, uh, Cody. You have the floor now. Thanks, um, thanks, Peter. I'll try to I'll try to keep this I'll try to keep it short and sweet because I know we're we're quite over the over the over the time. Um, so I think in terms of closing remarks, um, my my comment would be to urge that whatever is agreed as part of um, this whole process, part of COP, you know, COP twenty six from an Africa perspective, is one, it's achievable. Um, and that talks to some of the things we talked about today in terms of you know the NDCs. Also, an acknowledgement that there is a funding gap as part of that. And also, there's also an infrastructure gap as well. Um, so it's, there's money, but then there's also an actual live infrastructure gap in terms of getting things done from an Africa perspective. Um, it's just not, the terrain is not like the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's different and each country has own set of peculiarities. And interesting enough, people think of Africa, but we've made the mistake, Africa is not just one. Africa is not just one country. It's many, many countries on one continent. So it's, it'll be different solutions for different countries. Um, an acknowledgement of that. Then <clears throat> the other thing is that whatever is agreed should also be transparent and made transparent so that people can see it. Um, I'm sure it's available. Um, and maybe it's also a lack of, maybe it's also a lack of initiative on our part from a private sector perspective, but also making it very transparent so that people know this is what um, the various the various countries have have agreed to. And then finally, it needs to cater for Africa's circumstances. Um, and I think that's been well said and said many times by, you know, in numerous ways by people on this call, right? Um, whatever is agreed needs to be needs to cater for, for our set of circumstances. And then finally, it's really around also bridging the funding gap. Um, you know, there's talk of, you know, various special funds to be set up and people are doing things. Um, it may not be publicized, it may not be advertised, but people are doing things. I mean, we've recently, but it, it is only still scratching the surface. I mean, we've set up a specific infrastructure debt fund which is targeted at infrastructure, including power, um, which to Anita's point, does provide long-term local currency. So people are doing things, but it's really only scratching the surface. So there needs to be more initiatives, whether it's a special renewables fund, whether it's whatever fund that needs to be set up, there needs to be an emphasis on how do we um, bridge the funding gap. And then finally, I think the point that I think was made by Anita and also um, it was made by Arona as well, is that, you know, certain things should also be done by done in Africa. So do we try and attract Elon Musk to come and build a gigafactory somewhere in Africa? You know, certain things need to stay on the continent. It shouldn't be, <clears throat> we shouldn't treat this the same way as we've treated everything else, where everything is done outside and then gets brought into Africa. There should also be some of that value capture that happens on the continent. Um, and to end up, thank you very much um, for this. I think it was a very interesting discussion. Very interesting people. Albert, you can get my number from uh, Bilsat or um, Didi. So I'm waiting for you. I mean, Lagos, fly, we're here. Um, and yeah, so um, thank you very much. Thanks all.
Thank you so much, uh, Cody, for that. And 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 with that, I honestly this was this was really brilliant. Um, thank you so much for the the diverse perspectives, as 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 uh, Alkali said. Um, and we, you know, this is the beginning. Uh, we we are going to reach out to you. Uh, we're going to develop a lot of these concepts and 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 run with them, and specifically tap into each of your expertise to get this, this information, this knowledge to where it needs to get to, whether it's to the policymakers, whether as, as Albert suggested, getting the African Union together to, 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 um, to move forward in some of this, to get the information out. Uh, because uh, as we said, the people who are going to get affected by this, whether it's by climate, by energy access, it is the folks you know who who are in our villages in 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 our in our slums and we need to get this information out what is on the horizon what 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 are the impacts what are the shocks that you're going to have to um counter and what is the government what is everybody in their own level trying to do um to to make to make this um as as equitable and fair and just for you and for africa um so thank you very much for this. With that, um, uh, we end this call.